Ladies and gentlemen, would you please take a seat and we'll get started. All right, I'm not going to introduce myself. Uh, I think you know me at this point. Uh, well, I'm, I'm Dale Matchek. I'm the chairman of the Department of Economics for Northwood University, and I'm the academic director for the Freedom Seminar. And uh, it's also my pleasure to present here at the Freedom Seminar. Um, we've been doing this for 35 years. This is my 12th year at the Freedom Seminar, and I always enjoy the presentations. I always enjoy the conversations that take place in uh, conversation that takes place in between the uh, the presentations, and so I, I hope that you're having a good time and learning a lot. Today's topic that I want to address is one that's gained a lot of attention in recent years. Uh, you may have noticed the slogan of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, Wall Street, we're the 99 percent, and uh, I trust that all of us are actually in the 99 percent. I know that I am. Um, there may be some of us, this guy who's been earning a consistent rate of return of over 8% might be in the 1% someday, I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, I, I guess there's been a lot of concern, a lot of publicity, a lot of rhetoric about the trends in inequality, uh, especially in the United States. And you see quotations like this from very intelligent people. Robert Reich is the former uh, Secretary of Labor under President Clinton. Uh, he's a professor at Harvard University, and he makes this claim. Almost all the benefits of economic growth since the 1970s have gone to a small number of people at the very top. Well, that's a very long time for one group of people to be accumulating all the benefits of economic growth. But he's not the only one. Lou Dobbs is uh, a little bit more extreme in his rhetoric. He says, our political, business, and academic elites are waging an outright war on Americans. And I doubt that the middle class can survive the continued assault. And we have Paul Krugman. The gap between rich and poor has risen to a level not seen since the Gilded Age referring back to the 1920s when uh, Rockefeller and the other great tycoons had accumulated their fortunes and were paying taxes. Uh, this is pre-FDR at a very low rate, um, so keeping most of what they earned. Well, the Gilded Age uh, was, was a long time ago, and since then we've gotten used to the idea that our incomes rise continually, that each generation of Americans lives uh, better than their parents, and now there's a widespread insecurity and fear that maybe we're entering a new kind of American economy, one where our prospects are not so bright and uh, where our children's prospects perhaps are even worse. So um, I want to examine this. I'm disturbed by this kind of rhetoric for three reasons. First of all, it's wrong. It's just not factually correct. It's inaccurate. And that's what I want to present to you this afternoon. I also believe that it's dangerous rhetoric because when people hear those kinds of messages, they get scared. When people hear those kinds of messages, they start finger pointing and it divides us by class. It uh, incites class warfare. It's also simply distracting us from some of the real problems. There are reasons for the economic anxiety of the middle class and the bottom 50% have reasons to be concerned. There are some changes in our economy. But focusing on inequality as somehow the root cause, as something that needs to be cured with additional programs of redistribution, this, I think, is a distraction and not a solution. So let's start with a few basic facts to get our, our feet on the ground here. When it comes to income distribution in the United States, uh, one of the ways that we can look at it is to divide our country into fifths and take each fifth of the population. And then within that fifth, look at the median level of income within that group. So that's what we've done with this table. And this is data from the Census Bureau by household. And you can see how income is distributed. 
In the bottom, 50%, the median household income is 11,239. And you can see that uh, at the highest level, it's 178,000. Now, in this case, the top 20% um, doesn't seem to be that much wealthier than the bottom, so I'm not sure why this should be that disturbing to people. It's not until you get into the next uh, division where we start dividing that highest quintile into the top 5% or the top 1% of Americans, and that's where you get into uh, the idea that the super rich are getting richer and everybody else is falling behind. Take a look at our inequality compared to other countries. This table has given us uh, a Gini coefficient, which is another way to measure inequality. It's a number between zero and one, where zero represents perfectly unequal income, where the rich get everything, and one represents perfectly equal income, where everybody gets an equal share. So it's a number between zero and one. And you can see on this table that it ranges basically between 0.2 and 0.4 for most countries. The United States, on this graph, uh, you can see the blue line represents inequality in the United States in the 1990s, and the red bar represents inequality here in the mid-2000s. And you can see that, yeah, inequality has grown in the United States. But one of the things that uh, I want you to recognize from the table is, in most countries, inequality has grown. I mean, look at Canada. Some people call uh, Canada our quasi-socialist neighbor to the north, but uh, in many ways um, they're more equal, uh, I'm sorry, they're more economically free than we are in some respects. Um, but even with their more generous social programs, inequality has increased dramatically in Canada. Germany, again, the same way. So whatever's going on, it's not unique to the United States. It may be something that's happening to developing countries, and I think that should give us a clue as to uh, you know, what, if anything, we should do about it. Canada and Germany, they already have, in some ways, more uh, egalitarian public policies than we do. So if it were a matter of policy, I'm not sure that's uh, a good explanation for the trends that we see. And here's another way to look at these trends. Remember Paul Krugman said, we haven't seen inequality like this since the Gilded Age. Well, in this case, we're looking at the Gini coefficient over time, and the Gilded Age there would be where it peaks, or at least uh, somewhere around here, and you can see we had a Gini coefficient of over 50% for some time, and it actually had been rising continuously. Now, coincidentally, we did start the income tax as our previous speaker noted, in 1913. So this inequality was growing dramatically even though for the first time people were paying income taxes. But then we entered a long period of decreasing inequality and you can see beginning in 1970 it starts to grow and uh, has been growing more or less ever since. So the question is, um, is that graph I showed you, are those other numbers I showed you, what do they represent really? Um, what story are they telling us? One of the popular um, research reports that's often quoted in the press and by politicians and uh, opinion makers is a, a study by a couple of economists by the name of Pinkety and Sayers. And they did a study which showed the poor are getting poorer, the rich are getting richer. And uh, in this table, in the middle column, we show some of their results. And you can see, according to their analysis, we have had a tremendous divide where the very bottom of the income distribution has seen dramatic decreases in income, and the very top of the distribution has seen dramatic increases. But then if we look one more column to the right, we we'll see much different numbers. Those numbers are from an alternative uh, paper done by uh, economist Richard Burkhauser and his co-authors, and he comes up with much different numbers. And so what I want to do today is explain how two highly trained economists can look at the same kinds of information 
and come up with such widely diverging stories. And I think uh, I want to also encourage you to accept the column on the right as a more accurate uh, description of what's actually happening, even though it gets much less attention than the, uh, the numbers in the middle of that column. So here's what the uh, first authors I mentioned, Piketty and Sayers, claim that for the middle class, the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and the first decade of this century were a period of uh, economic stagnation. Incomes as a whole over that period, GDP grew by 70% as a whole, but the median income in America grew by only 3.2% what they claimed. Now, in this case, they used tax returns to calculate these numbers. And I don't dispute that their, their numbers are, are accurate. Um, they, they looked at those tax returns, and that's what the tax returns say. But their study is based on tax units. And a tax unit is a, is a strange thing. We know, most of us don't use that term in day-to-day -day life. Uh, I want to look at what Burkheiser and his colleagues did. He looked at something called a household. Well, what's the difference between a tax unit and a household? Well, to give you an example, a single person living alone is a tax unit. A married couple living together and filing jointly is a tax unit. So those are both tax units and those are both households. But how do you classify two people living together, sharing expenses, having children who don't happen to be legally married? Are they a tax unit or are they two tax units? And in fact, um, in the Pinkety and Sayers days, they treat them as if they are two tax units. And so you can see how this would automatically skew the data, creating more tax units in the bottom of the income distribution and reducing the median income. So if we were to treat those kinds of couples as a household, just as if they had been married, automatically that would lead to a huge change in um, our results. In fact, uh, oh, where's the number? Um, just to show you what's happening to households, you can see we're living differently in the two periods, and uh, we used to have a lot more married households. Now we have significantly fewer married households. And as a result, using tax units is probably a misleading strategy. If we had married at the same rate and divorced at the same rate during these decades as we did previously, you could use tax units and get pretty decent results. But uh, I think under the circumstances, it's better to use households. And when we do use households, we get that the median income rose by about 12% over this period. That's simply treating two people living together as if they are a single household, which in fact they are. Now the other thing that uh, has happened, which has been important, is that many new single parent households have developed over the last 40 years, and that has had also an impact on poverty and inequality. Um, divorce is pretty hard economically, or not marrying at all, and having children can be very hard economically. And in spite of uh, some of the highly publicized superstars and wealthy people who uh, characterize that as a lifestyle choice, for many people this is something that uh, happens to them unexpectedly and uh, is a real economic burden. So if you look at this, um, if people were still getting married at the same rate as my parents and, and grandparents, then of course uh, we'd have to adjust the numbers again. There'd be fewer single households and more households sharing expenses. Now, I portrayed this as a negative thing. I suppose we could consider it a positive thing. It may be that in the old days people were staying together because they didn't feel they had the economic resources to split up. Now, because our economy has grown, we're better off, maybe we're th thinking now, well, I don't need to stay with this you know, jerk. I can move out and establish my own household. And, and maybe that's what's happening. So no matter how you spin it, though, it has a, a really important impact on the numbers. And if you're going to compare 40 years ago to today, you have to compare apples with apples. 20%. That's already seven times what Pinkett and Sayers said was happening to income, but of course there's more adjustments to make. 
When it comes to equality, most people are concerned about living standards rather than income. And on those tax returns, Pinkerty and Sainz were looking at market income. And that is one measure of living standards, but another measure would be what can you actually buy? And when we look at it that way, we have to take into account the effect of public policies on our purchasing power. And in particular, the effect of taxes, which take a big chunk of our income, and transfers, which sometimes supplement our income. And when we look at transfer payments, they are nowhere near today as limited as they were in 1970. Today, we have almost 50% of Americans receiving government benefits of one kind or another. If 50% of households are having their incomes augmented by government help of, you know, we have bridge cards or um, various kinds of uh, housing uh, subsidies, etc. If they're getting these things, then uh, their living standards could be rising even if their incomes haven't fallen significantly. So let's take a look at the effect of taxes. And you can see um, the taxes in the, in the following slide. I just wanted to, to kind of preview it a little bit. What do you expect to happen to the share of taxes paid by people in the lower part of the income distribution? Has that been rising in recent years? Have we been shifting the burden of taxes away from the rich and onto the middle class and the poor? Or has it been going the opposite direction? Yeah, not only opposite, but extremely so, as this graph will show us. Back in 1986, as recently as 1986, the top 1% only paid about 25% of income taxes in this country. Now they're over uh, they're about 40%. Uh, okay. Meanwhile, the bottom 95% of the distribution paid over 50% of the taxes in the past, and now they're down to about the same as the top 1%. So the top 1% are paying about as much as the bottom 95% combined. Okay. So when you take into account the effect of taxes, we have to take into account the changes in tax policy. What happened during these decades? Most people do remember, and Paul Krugman will definitely bring this to our attention, that we cut income tax rates for the very wealthy. But it's also true that during the same period, we cut income tax rates across the board, and we removed many Americans from the bottom of our income distribution we removed many of them off the tax rolls altogether, and now they're not paying income taxes at all. That wasn't true in 1979. So when we take into account the effect of taxes and transfers, we now see a rise in the median household income after taxes and transfers of about 37%. Now, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it only rises by 30% at this point. The 37% that you see on this slide actually comes from adding to that employer-provided benefits, which have also changed dramatically over the last four decades. And you can see in this slide what's been happening to employer-provided benefits, particularly health insurance. You sometimes hear that wages have stagnated, that wages have fallen even. And actually on the end of this little diagram, uh, you can see that wages have stagnated. They've gone below this line, which represents zero. So we hit negative growth in wages, but meanwhile, employee benefits, though, have grown at a robust pace and much faster than wages. As a result, compensation as a whole has been growing. And when we take that compensation into account, that's where we get the 37% rise in income, which is almost four times what the, the uh, Pinkett and Sayers uh, data shows. All right, now, we're already at 37% growth in the median household income, which is pretty good. But even that, I believe, understates the true increase in living standards that the average person has achieved over the last uh, 40 years. And that's because we also have to take into account the change in the purchasing power of the dollar. We've had chronic inflation. And in 
In cases like this, it's difficult to compare the purchasing power of people living 40 years apart. We try to do it using a price index. Uh, what does it cost for a typical basket of goods? And how does that cost change over time? And using that technique, we can discount current incomes in order to put them in a past year's context. So basically, the consumer price index would tell us how much would it cost to buy the same basket of goods today. But let me ask you, who in their right mind would buy the same basket of goods today? Today, I've noticed many of you using laptops. You couldn't buy that in 1979. I noticed many of you using smartphones. Did not exist. In fact, cell phones were on the market for 15 years before our government decided to start counting them in the typical market basket of goods. We also have a problem with quality. Um, I bought a car, not back in 1979, but back in 1985, and I paid $7,000 for it, my first car. You might say, wow, that's cheap. But the fact of the matter is, if you could sell that car today, I doubt if anybody would pay 3000 for it. It was a piece of junk. Today's cars may be more expensive, but they're also a lot safer. They're more fuel efficient. They're uh, more durable and reliable. And so in many ways, it's hard to compare the price of goods because they're getting so much better over time. When we make these corrections, in the consumer price index for changes in quality and consumer uh, innovation and, and preferences, we find that the consumer price index overstates the rate of inflation by probably about a half a percent. And when you compound that over a period of 40 years, that can lead to a big error in your estimate of real income. Not only that, but we should probably use a typical basket by income quintile, because what the people at the bottom buy is typically very different from what the people at the top buy. So when we examine the typical market basket for somebody in the bottom half of the income distribution, or in particular in the bottom 20%, we find that in fact inflation has not been nearly severe as on that basket as it has for the basket of the goods that are purchased typically by wealthier people. So in other words, if we were to use a basket tailored to the actual habits of individuals, we would find that rich pay, uh, face a higher rate of inflation, and as a result, we would discount their incomes a little bit more when comparing them to the past. And the poor face a lower rate of inflation, which means we would discount their incomes a little bit less, and this would produce uh, a much uh, faster rate of growth on the bottom and slower rate of growth on the top. All right, now here's another point that we need to make. When looking at incomes, and especially comparing rich and poor, we can get a misleading result of living standards, because typically uh, incomes are much more unequally distributed than actual consumption. This is a stylized table just to show you, um, you know, how the rich and the poor might divide their income into things they buy for themselves, savings or investment, which is the red bar in this graph, or things which they buy for others. In other words, gifts, philanthropy, charity. And if you have a lot of income, then, and, and, and this is actually, um, you know, reflected in the data, you tend to consume a much lower proportion of it. And so on this bar chart, you can see the blue line, which represents consumption, much more equally distributed than the bars as a, as a whole. And so income can be unequally distributed even when consumption is more equally distributed. And consumption, I would argue, is a much better measure of living standards. After all, what is happening to that income that's invested? It's not contributing to the utility of the person who invested it. It's out there working. It's out there being used to purchase equipment or to uh, sponsor a new entrepreneur and venture capital. It's uh, maybe being given to Northwood as a gift to fund private donor scholarships. 
for the next generation of entrepreneurs and business leaders. So the point is, if it's not being consumed by the rich, I'm not sure that we can really count that as uh, part of their living standard. And uh, when it comes to this, the poor actually consume a heck of a lot more than their, uh, their income would suggest. In fact, here's a, a chart that I saw recently that I think is very revealing. We want to look at the top line along these four households for income, but we look at the bottom line for actual consumption. And you can see how unequally the income is distributed. Now this was an example which was prepared by Wyatt Emmerich. And uh, he looked at some hypothetical households in Mississippi. He examined uh, the various public policies and benefits available at both the federal and the state level to these households. And if you look at the data, you can see a household making only $3,625 a year is eligible, hypothetically, for $31,630 worth of benefits. And meanwhile, the household making $60,000 is eligible for, under our current policy, 34,366. And that's not a big difference. So uh, obviously that reinforces the point that if we worry about what we can actually obtain for our money, uh, that's much more equally distributed than what we, we earn. Another question we could ask, should we look at consumption or the satisfaction that consumption brings. Now, one of the things that economists like to do is they like to talk about utility and how much satisfaction consumer goods provide. And, and in particular, they talk about this principle of diminishing marginal utility. The idea that you have more of something as you consume more. Your second car is great. Your third car was good. Your fourth car is getting redundant. And because of this principle of diminishing marginal utility, utility rises more slowly than consumption, or disproportionately slowly. So your consumption might double, but does your utility or your living standard measured in utility, does that double? Not at all. So here's what we have. We start with a comparison of market incomes, and we get a big increase in inequality. That's the Piketty and Sayers data. Then we adjusted that. Instead of looking at tax units, we look at households. And we know that households, there are actually fewer households than there are tax units. So we make that adjustment. Then we adjusted for differences in marriage behavior. We said, look, people are preferring either that or they find themselves unexpectedly living single, whereas in the past with children they would have married at a higher rate. And if we adjust for those differences in lifestyle, we get a much more equally distributed income. Then we ask the question, what do people actually have to dispose of after government policies, taxes and transfers? And we found, again, this tends to improve the distribution, make it more equal. Then we consider different rates of inflation. Now this is all probably getting kind of tedious uh, and it's something that maybe economists could enjoy talking about and get into, but it doesn't make a good headline in the New York Times. It's not something a blogger could probably make uh, a lot of, uh, you know, working for Occupy Wall Street. It's not going to get people to come down to the town square and start uh, camping out and protesting. It's, it's the kind of stuff that, uh, we need to pay attention to, but uh, it's not the kind of stuff that most of us are aware of. It's not newsworthy. We also looked at changes in consumption rates and diminishing marginal utility. All of these adjustments mean that in many ways we are better off today. I don't think I need to look at the numbers because I was alive back in 1979. Ask your parents, is life better today? Are living standards higher today? And I think uh, they will tell you that, yeah, things are getting better. There's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of dynamism in the economy. In fact, I think one of the things that has really uh, changed people's perspective and made them forget that the United States was one of the world's fastest growing economies. We grew at a, a steady 3% uh, 
for uh, decades on average. Um, but this latest crisis, this, uh, this lesser recession, followed by this tepid recovery, the high unemployment rates, of course it creates anxiety. And during times of anxiety, historically, people have always uh, looked for scapegoats. Uh, there's always been this temptation to engage in finger pointing and perhaps class warfare. And I think that explains a lot of the interest in this. Uh, but the fact is, uh, it's not as bad as has been reported. All right. So inequality has not grown as quickly as some of the inflated rhetoric would have us believe. But even then, I think there are other reasons to be doubtful about the reports that we hear. Everything I've given to you so far has been reported in terms of some economic aggregate. I've compared one group of people living today with another group of people living 40 years ago. I've compared two different groups of individuals. And I think that can be very misleading. For example, what if we had to compare what's happening to the equality of height in America? And we compared Americans alive today to Americans living 50 years ago. What would the data show us? Would height become more equal, less equal, same distribution as it always was? What do you think? How many think height would be more equal now than it was back then? Or less equal or just the same? It's more equal now because of the baby boomers. They were kids back then. The baby boomers were small, okay? And now they're tall. So when we compare these things, we have to keep in mind that people don't stay at the same height their entire lives. And if we apply that principle to measuring income, we have to keep in mind that people don't stay at the same level of income their entire lives either. So to see how significant, uh, well, I'm sorry. See how significant this can uh, be. Let's take a hypothetical example where we're truly focusing on individuals over time and we're keeping track of what's happening to their income. So here I have five, actually six hypothetical individuals. I've given them names alphabetically, so you can keep track of them as A, B, C, and D. Amy had $10,000 that put her at the bottom of the income distribution in period one, and her income grew slightly so that by the end of period two, it had risen by 10%. And likewise, you can read the numbers, uh, all of them near the bottom of the income distribution experienced gains in income. But near the top, Doug and Ed saw a decline in their income. Doug, a significant decline. And as a result, we would have to say that looking at this particular table, that in this example, the rich got poorer and the poor got richer. Now let's just change a little bit of information. When we use quintiles, as I did earlier, to compare incomes, we get a much different picture. And in this case, I'm just going to add two events. Kathy and Ed get married, and baby Flavius grows up and establishes his own independent household. What do you suppose is going to happen to income? Now, you know I, I put this together so it would have an exaggerated impact, but this is what happens. All of those gains in income went to the top quintile. Okay? Why? It's Ed and Kathy. They got married. Okay? Flavius, he's a young guy. When you start out, you don't make so much money. So, I want to go back to this slide here. If we were to actually start to dig beneath the aggregates a little bit, to look at what the situation is within those households, we would find some, I suppose, predictable characteristics of the, the members of each household. First of all, uh, I've compared the top and the bottom here, the number of people that are actually working in that household. Turns out people in the top are kind of like Ed and Kathy in my example. People at the top typically do have two income earners. 
In fact, uh, if you look at the average number of earners, they have more than two. You have more than two people in that household employed. The type of employment, three quarters of those households were employed in full-time jobs, whereas in the bottom, less than a third, or approximately a third. Um, what about the age? I said people starting out make less than average, but it's also true that people that are retired and have given up their salaried or hourly job, they're not receiving that check every month uh, from their work, but they may have other means of support, uh, you know, drawing down their savings. And so uh, Social Security, which doesn't count as market income. And so they are also overrepresented at the bottom, the very young and the very old, whereas people in the top quintile tend to be in their prime earnings years. This inequality that exists, it exists naturally because of differences in the life stage, differences in people's life choices. It's not necessarily anything to be alarmed about. It's, uh, I would call it perfectly natural. Okay. So I gave you a hypothetical example. What if we were to look at some real numbers about how individual income changes over time? Our Treasury Department did that. It made a report looking at inequality in the period uh, 1995 to 2000, and, I'm sorry, 1996 to 2005, and here's what they discovered. During that period, more than half of taxpayers had moved from one quintile to another. So there's a lot of people moving. If you look at people in the bottom quintile, half of them had moved up. They also looked at previous decades and found that there was no change in mobility. It's not true that somehow it's getting harder and harder to move up in the income distribution. Uh, it is still possible, at least it's just as possible as it was in the previous decade. And when they looked at individuals and what was happening to their income, they found that during this period, now remember it's not 40 year period, it's a 10 year period, during this period the median uh, taxpayer saw their income increase by 24 percent. Two thirds of the people in the study had higher incomes at the end of the period. And the biggest increases in income came at the bottom. Now, I think this is uh, perhaps a better way to, to show what happened. Oh, wait, I've, I've, lost, I've lost a slide. Here we go. Here's another way to look at it. This bar graph shows what's happened to uh, income in the lowest quintile. It grew by 90% on average, whereas in the top 1%, it fell by 25% over the same period. Now if you had a look at this graph and you were asked, are the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, it'd be hard to draw that conclusion. But remember, you're looking at exactly at individuals whose income is changing. And we're not only concerned about individuals and the way their income is changing, but Generations. It's been, uh, as I indicated earlier, part of the American dream that your children will have a better life than you did. And uh, there's some anxiety that maybe that's no longer the case, that story is changing. Um, of course, past performance is, is no uh, predictor of future performance, but if we look at the recent past, we can see that it is very true and even more likely. If your parents came from the bottom, you're very likely to be better off than your parents were. In fact, here we see 82% of the children whose parents were in the bottom quintile find themselves in a higher quintile than their parents. Okay? Parents in the top quintile, their children, eh, less than half of them are able to stay in the top quintile. Okay? So if you come from a wealthy family, you know, take this as a, a word to the wise. Don't take it for granted. You're going to have to work for it just as much as they did. But in any case, we do see some intergenerational mo mobility. Okay, so bottom line, we, we, we hear about equality as a whole, what's happening to it. 
Um, I, I try to tell the story, and I think many economists would agree, that inequality has not been rising dramatically when we examine quintiles, I think, accurately. But I would have to agree with those that say the top 1% does seem to be something going on there with the top 1%. And I think this accounts for what we saw in the international data. We see this inequality going uh, on not only in the United States but elsewhere. It's because in the trends in the global economy in recent years, people who have particularly scarce and scalable talents are making a lot more money. Give you example. I'll give you an example. Hedge fund managers, the top, uh, I think it's the top 25 hedge fund managers and 2009 made 25 billion dollars between them. That's an average of a billion dollars a piece. Now Justin Verlander just signed a big contract as a star pitcher for the Detroit Tigers and people thought that was big money. I think it was 120 million. And it's going to take him something like eight years to get it. We're talking about somebody who has ten times that much in a single year. And Justin Verlander himself is in the top 1%. But you can see, even in the top 1%, there's a great deal of inequality. So the question is, uh, you know, why are these people making so much money? Well, think about a hedge fund manager. What's happened in recent years as we've gone to the market around the world, as people in China or people in India are free to invest their money where it's going to generate the highest return, and people who know how to generate that return are in big demand. And they can demand, and they do get incredible commissions. 20% of the profits is typical for a hedge fund in, of this type. And if you don't deliver those higher rates of return, then nobody's willing to pay that kind of commission. So, I think that is something that's going on, and it's not something that is a result of policy or anything like that. Um, in fact, I don't see anything sinister in that at all. I think it's very good that people are rewarded according to their talents. Nobody's forcing to give these people money. And uh, if they don't do their job, if they don't deliver what people value, then uh, pretty soon they're going to see themselves falling out of that 1% bracket. So uh, that's, a, that's a small part of it. But it's also true in business, that businesses are going global. And as a result, they're scaling up whatever their great idea is and serving many more people. Two-thirds of the people in the top 1% are entrepreneurs. And I would argue that entrepreneurs are a very rare and valuable resource. They are the source of our economic progress. And if they're successful, even more so. So I'm not sure that that should be a cause for concern for the rest of us. After all, if you leave the top 1% out of it, income distribution hasn't really changed over the last 20 years. But uh, you know, it has gone up for the top 1%. All right. So as I said, I, I, I think the rhetoric is wrong. I think the numbers that you see most often are misleading. And now I want to come to my second point. I think it's dangerous to repeat these numbers without any nuance, without any uh, description or correction in people's, it changes people's perception and it's dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Number one, because it creates, I believe, a, an artificial trade-off between one kind of equality and another. We can pursue one or we can pursue another. If people are different, they are going to have unequal incomes, right? We are different by nature. We try uh, you know, we make different kinds of effort, we have different kinds of talent, different opportunities, different experiences. So we're going to have different incomes. But in spite of that, we can be treated equally under the law. As you heard from Dr. Ebeling this morning, this equal treatment under the law is one of the core principles of a sound philosophy of liberty. And it is attainable. We can have this kind of equality. But we cannot have both. In order to have equality of income, you must treat individuals differently. There must be a different set of rule tailored to each individual. We're going to take this much from you. We're going to treat you. We're going to give this much. To you. 
we're going to prevent you from taking advantage of that opportunity. And as a result, the law becomes a battleground. It divides us. It becomes a game where the outcome of every election becomes more and more um, acrimonious and more and more important to us. It pits us one against another. It also discourages individual responsibility. To give you uh, a stark example of this, I want to use an example that Charles Murray talks about in his book, Losing Ground, published back in 1984. Charles Murray is a sociologist and he uh, talks about trends in American uh, culture. He goes through an example of a young couple, a teenage couple, that finds themselves in trouble in 1960. Well, what kind of trouble? Phyllis is pregnant. Now in those days, very few children were actually born or lived uh, in single parent households. If this happened, usually Harold and Phyllis were expected to get married, Harold was expected to get a job, an honorable guy did that, a good guy did that, and um, that's what normally happened. Now whether that's a good system or a bad system, um, you know, that's the way it was done. And certainly there was an economic incentive, at least for Harold to work in this case, because if he didn't, this family would be left with nothing. So Harold did, I think, the honorable thing here. He married Phyllis. And they had $111 worth of income. And, there were, and it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor in those days. Both of them basically had the same lifestyle choices with respect to children. Only 4% of children in those days were born to single parents. Today it's 40%. And this may be one of the reasons for that change. Now in this case, we're looking only 10 years later. We've changed government policy to help redistribute wealth, and I think the intentions are good. And you can kind of see how it might influence Harold and Phyllis in their choice. In this case, if you are Phyllis, and Harold is a good guy, and he's going out there and he's looking for a job, and he says, Phyllis, honey, I, I'm going to stand by you and the baby, and I'm going to marry you. And if you're Phyllis, what are you going to say? Don't you dare. Okay? You bring home that paycheck, but I don't want any part of this marriage. Why not? According to the incentive on the graph, what's going to happen to their income if they get married? It's going to go down because the way the transfer programs were designed, it was almost a one for one dollar reduction when you got added to that household and that only took a marriage certificate. When you got added to that household, your income was counted against your welfare benefit and you lost your welfare benefit at a rate of almost one dollar for every dollar you earned. Okay? Now what if they retained their romantic notions and they got married anyway? And after a while, they get into a little bit of a fight, as newlyweds often do. And Harold says, you know, I, we were young. Um, I thought you were a nice, nicer person than you turned out to be. Um, you know, in the past, I might feel a little bit guilty about leaving you at this point. But you, you'll be okay. Because what's going to happen to... Phyllis's income when Harold leaves. Two bucks. Essentially, Harold is working a full-time minimum wage job for two bucks a week. Okay? It's not a good deal for him. And even if he does continue to live with Phyllis, again, why bother showing up for work? So I can't blame Harold. I certainly don't blame Harold for uh, staying at home most of the time. And you can see this in the data. The labor force participation rates for the bottom 20% changed dramatically. It's not as though there were fewer job opportunities. I'm not comparing today's economy with what was happening back then. I'm talking about an economy where unemployment rates were as low as 5% or even lower. And even during those times, people neither working nor looking for work. In this quintile, more and more people simply dropped out of the labor force 
more and more people simply stopped marrying. Now the thing is, I want to point out, that the first generation to live this way probably felt a little bad about it because they inherited some social capital from their parents. Here's the way you do it. And they might have been a little bit of ashamed of telling people how they had changed the pattern. And, uh, but, you know, what about their kids? We got a small test of this when we actually reformed welfare recently, in 1996, and we changed these terrible incentives to reward people who wanted to stay together, to reward people who accepted work. And we didn't remove their welfare benefits dollar for dollar. But what happened to their behavior? Nothing. No significant change in family formation, no significant change in labor uh, participation among the, the men in, in this group. Okay. So, the point is, the culture of individual responsibility, which as recently as 1960 was strong, even in the lowest level of our income distribution, has uh, virtually been annihilated. Uh, I've got to be my own timekeeper because there's nobody standing in the back waving. And um, also, I made a mistake because I told you in advance that if we get started early, we'll finish early, and, and you'll probably just anxiously waiting for me to stop talking. You're not waiting for the next message. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to interrupt my presentation here because fortunately I do have some time. It's not going to be on Sunday morning as your schedule originally indicated. It's going to be tomorrow morning that I'm speaking and Tim Nash's presentation has been moved to Sunday. But I'll pick up at this point on, uh, at 8.30 tomorrow morning. And as for you, you're free to... Um, you know, take a break. There's a few sites to see around town or in the hotel. And we are going to be in our seats, receiving our dinners in our seats at 6.30.